we've been talking about uh, forging and buy to fly ratios and hot isostatic pressing and whatnot. Um, today I want to just finish up on some of that and talk about rolling. Um, and, and rolling is another way to get rid of the casting defects. I've got these pores or inclusions or whatever. And if I take the ingot and I roll it and I get 80% deformation or more, and then I can end up with plate or sheet or something else um, and get rid of those defects. It's not a forged material, it's a rolled material. Uh, four, four times extension. 75%. 75% deformation is, means it's down to one quarter. You def if it was four inches thick and you deform it 75%, it's one inch thick. That means that it's extended its length by four times. Okay, that's the way deformation people think of it. Unless you're talking about a wire, if you reduce the diameter of a wire by 75%, you have it 16 times longer, right? Because it goes as the area, right? It goes as R squared. So um, wires take less diameter reduction to get the same 75. You need 75% squeeze to squeeze out the defects and get things together and enough extension to extend the contamination that you get enough bonding, okay? That was what the whole cold welding thing was all about, okay? And it, the iron number is around 75, 80% deformation before you, the iron oxide, remember that whole thing on the cold welding had to do with indium was the easiest one because it had a super hard oxide and a soft metal. And that meant that when you, you would break the oxide and then you wouldn't spread it out like peanut butter. Copper oxide, you need like 90, 95% deformation because copper oxide is like peanut butter. You could squeeze it together, but then as you extend the surface in shear, all you're doing is spreading the peanut butter and you've still got contamination there, okay, over the whole thing. You've got to get to like 10 times new surface before copper will bond to itself, before you spread the oxide out thin enough that it's no longer harmful, okay? I mean, you still got inclusions in the metal, but the metals have inclusions anyway, little oxide particles. But if you have big distance between those oxide particles, and they're uh, 50 microns, 2,000ths of an inch in size, you know, you can do any fractional mechanics you want on them, they're not harmful, okay, in a ductile material. In a ceramic, it'll cause it to break. But in a ductile material, it won't. So you can tolerate Inclusion defects or flaws, not defects, they're flaws, imperfections in the metal. As long, in fact, most metals have something on the order of 1% inclusions or dirt within them. You polish it and look at it on the surface. And they have various standards for this. You can you can uh, make this, the steel cleaner by doing vacuum melting or something like that. So if you can't make some kid's wagon out of a piece of steel that's vacuum melted. You can make an aircraft landing gear out of vacuum melted steel. Okay. And in fact, you have to make aircraft landing gears or um, uh, crankshafts for uh, for uh, uh, aircraft engines. Those are vacuum melted because if you vacuum melt, you get the oxygen out and you have less inclusions. Okay, and these things can fail by fatigue. And so a little flaw in some of these high strength applications, a small flaw and a big delta K, a big stress, means a big delta K and you can get fatigue cracks. So, uh, for example, the uh, uh, Sioux City, Iowa crash, uh, where they lost the turbine disc, okay, and the guy landed successfully in Sioux City, the, the hero pilot, but they had a titanium nitride inclusion in that titanium disc, and it was about a quarter of an inch or something in size. I didn't work on it, but other people, uh, Professor Blue here did, and some other people did. Um, uh, it was like a quarter of an inch in size. Well, that was all vacuum melted, electron beam remelted, and they should have gotten rid of that. Remember I told you that the defect size is proportional to the casting size? What they do, titanium has to be vacuum melted, um, but they they remelt the whole, they, they take an ingot, um, here's an ingot, Okay. Um, and so they take this ingot and they basically remelt it into a copper chill. And so the, uh, the solidifying layer is maybe only an inch thick. So the biggest flaws you're going to have are going to be some fraction of an inch. Well, this was about a quarter of an inch. 
and that was bigger than usual. And they should have been able to pick it up with ultrasonics, but for various reasons, they missed it. And T crack grew from that. Um, if I go to aircraft landing gears, where the steel is going to be heat treated to 300 ksi, and the fracture toughness is going to be down to 50 ksi square root of inch, and you go to calculate the size of the flaws that you can tolerate, you're down to something like a millimeter or so. So you don't want inclusions that could be a quarter of a millimeter. Because statistically, you get a couple of them together and you're going to get them cracks and, and things. And so you could actually get brittle fracture in that case from bigger flaws. So it depends, you know, if you're making a kid's wagon, you don't care about quarter inch flaws. So you don't have to vacuum melt. But if I really want to get something really clean, I vacuum melt. And I often do remelting in a process such that the, the casting, I might end up with a big part, but I'm can, I'm casting it in, in a continuous or semi-continuous manner, and the, the liquid pool from which the metal is solidifying is much smaller, and therefore the size defects are gonna be smaller, okay? So there's all kinds of little tricks that we do. Um, I, I passed around that, that brass piece or the magnesium bronze piece that uh, we had done the electron beam melting on. Well, now you've got little, little, it's like putting a little string and wrapping it around something. And the size of the flaws, or the size of the casting is only, uh, you know, three sixteenths of an inch. So the maximum size flaw is, is significantly smaller. In fact, that's basically what the student, one of the students' doctoral thesis was on, was Inconel 718, which is a, uh, turbine disc alloy and um, regular as cast turbine, turbine disc and forged can have flaws that are uh, a tenth of a millimeter or even two tenths or three tenths of a millimeter in size. When you do his process of this little electron beam and build the thing up that way, they're, they're about five times smaller. And so, therefore, your fatigue life is going to be better. Okay, and that's an important thing. So, you actually can get better properties when you do things like that. You get finer grain size and other things. Uh, other questions? Which actually leads us into some of this other stuff about um, if I want to roll something, I can roll things all the way down to sheet. But it turns out I can't just use one rolling mill. If I want to start with big heavy plate or what we call blooms or billets or ingots um, that are four to eight, ten inches thick, I need a big rolling mill. And that rolling mill is going to cost me something on the order of a half a billion dollars for the whole plant. Okay? It's going to be one and a half times the length of a football field. It's going to have rolls that are three, four feet in diameter. The world's largest rolling mill is in Davenport, Iowa. It's owned by Alcoa, and it has rolls that are about six, six feet in diameter. Have you been there? No. No, we're thinking about going there. Oh, okay. Yeah. Where are they making rolls at? Steel. Okay. And the, uh, the Davenport is where they make the four inch aluminum plate that is going to be machined into the wings of aircraft, for example. Um, and the, uh, the aluminum is hot, but the steel is water cooled. Right, there's a little story on that. that we want to tell the stories on Davenport. Um, I had an LFM student working at the Davenport plant. And they were having a significant amount of scrap because the plate was not coming in at the right thickness. And so we watched when I was out at the plant and, and uh, the student and I looked at the process. And basically they rolled these great big plates back and forth underneath the, the rolls. And at some point they thought it was close to the final gauge. They would stop the mill. A guy would pull up this little wooden step ladder three or four steps, he would get up there with some micrometers and he would reach out and he would measure the thickness of the plate. This is high technology here, right? <laughs> At one spot, okay? Well, that was the thickness of the plate. And based on that, they kind of calibrated, did one or two more passes, finished the plate. And then they goes down to the next spot where they're gonna do some heat treatment or something else. And someone takes a micrometer and they measure the thickness, but in a different spot. And lo and behold, it's not the same, okay? And they were getting all kinds of variation. So uh, uh, I suggested that Julie should, uh, over the next couple months, um, measure, take a couple of plates through, get an ultrasonic thickness gauge, and plot exactly what the shape of these plates look like. And so she comes back in September, for a lot of you, for those of you that are LFMs, and she shows me a picture that schematically looks like this. 
here's the plate. At one end, it's got this big bump on it. And sometimes the plates have big bumps on both ends. And so the first I look at that, I thought, and this is not a small thing. This might be a three quarter inch plate. And this might be off by 5%, 30 thousandths of an inch. So this is 780 versus 750. And so uh, I'm sitting down there in my office and uh, she showed me this data. And finally, oh, I thought, I know what it is. I remember when we were out there to cool the steel rolls when you have these hot plates going through, we just kind of have water pouring over the rolls to keep the rolls from getting too hot and distorting and stuff. And I remember you have this hot aluminum plate and I remember when I was watching that one day that I'd see the, the steam coming off the surface because some of the some of the water from the steel rolls would pool on the plates. And I remember at the end of the plate there'd be this pooling. You know, have you ever seen if you pour uh, water on on uh, something that's four or five hundred degrees, and you pour enough water on, you actually you form steam, and the and the water actually is levitated on this layer of steam because you're the heat transfer. If you ever poured liquid nitrogen on the floor, it's the exact same thing. The liquid nitrogen is uh, basically levitated by the, the gaseous nitrogen from the warm floor, okay, below it. So it's the same type of thing. And I said, you know, I bet they're cooling down the ends of the plate. And she shows me the, the force separation on the plates, on the rolls. And lo and behold, sometimes you'd see a single blip as the plate comes through at one end, uh, increase in force, separating force of the, that they monitor on the rolls. And the other one, you'd see it at both ends. I said, you need to go find out, you know, and, and monitor that and find out what's going on. She calls me up the next week and she says, well, you know, they actually intentionally roll the plate with the, with the top roll going a little bit slower than the bottom roll because you don't want the plate, if it distorts, to go into the bed of the uh, table uh, where you have all these other little rolls because it'll just tear up the bed. I mean, you just destroy your equipment. So they actually intentionally try to put a little curl on the end of the plate so it won't dig into the bed, which meant that you end up getting a, a little pool where you could collect the water. And sometimes you collect it on one end, and sometimes you collect it on both ends. And Julie did the analysis and showed that for the amount of cooling we expected, this end of the plate would cool down faster than the rest of it was just cooling in air. And she could explain 70% of the variation they were getting just by the water catching on the plate. I thought, okay, this is great. For $10,000, yeah, yeah. By it cooling more rapidly, it wouldn't roll as easily, is that what Yeah, yeah, it just increases the strength of the material. Okay, just like the World Trade Center, as it gets hot, the steel gets weaker. Well, as the aluminum gets hot, it gets weaker. So the cooler aluminum is stronger, and for the same separating force, you get less, less deformation, right? So, so I said, well, this is an easy problem to solve. Uh, you can get rid of 70% of your process variation by just putting in an air knife. An air knife is just compressed air that you blow the water off the surface, right? They already had compressed air in the plant, I figured, even in a great big mill like that, it couldn't cost more than $10,000 $10, to put some piping in, right? Now, you would say, why would it cost more than $500? But you're in a big mill, a big plant, okay? It will cost them $10,000. If it was General Motors, it cost $100,000 because they're a bigger company. The bigger the company, the more inefficient. And it's true. I mean, I might get, and we're talking orders of magnitude here, okay? There's a reason why small companies can compete with big companies, okay? They don't have this overhead, okay, of managing stuff. So they already had the compressed air. So anyway, so Julie writes her thesis. No one in the Davenport plant even bothers to read it, of course. So I'm in a National uh, Research Council meeting, and here's the guy who's head of deformation at Alcoa Research Labs, and I'm telling him this story. I said, you know, it's my bet that they'll never implement this. He says, oh, I'll make sure they do. So a year later, we were at another one of these meetings. I said, uh, uh, by the way, uh, they ever put the air knife in? I don't know. I told him. I said, I said I'll bet you $10,000 they don't. Okay? And now he didn't accept the bet. But uh, he said, I'll make sure they do. A year later, we were at this same type of meeting together. And I said, by the way, did they ever put this air knife in at the Davenport plant? He just turned on his heel and walked away. Okay? I will bet you it's still not there. Okay? And they still, so when you go, if you do go, why don't you ask them, okay? 
Okay, I figured a one day payback, because if you don't scrap one plate, you probably save yourself $10,000. But the, the, the moral of this story is, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink, okay? And, and you can tell people what their problem is, but if they don't want to solve it, just let them wallow in their mire, okay? Um, there's actually from 25 years ago, there was a very interesting uh, technology that came out of that same plant. When they heat treat the aluminum, they, uh, they have these spray nozzles. And these are the plates that are going to be heat treated and they're going to go into the aircraft. We're still not getting filled and sort of stuff, but anyway. Um, but some of these stories are good stories. Um, and they have a world. Okay. Um, so they, they discovered that one of the nozzles was clogged. And they didn't know how many months it had been clogged. Um, but it, it could have been as much as, I don't know, I wasn't involved in this. I was a young assistant professor 25 years ago. But they got the National Bureau of Standards involved. They got all kinds of people. Because basically what this meant is a strip of plate in one of these big plates was not properly quenched and therefore it wouldn't have proper strength. And these, they've been making, Boeing had been making aircraft wings out of this, these plates coming from this plant, for a, and so did McDonnell Douglas, for a number of months. And the question is, do I, do I have aircraft out there flying around whose wings are going to come off because of this uh, clogged nozzle in the process plant? And uh, so there was a major program with the FAA and the companies and everybody working together to try to resolve this, this problem. It turns out, out of that, they had to develop some new design destructive test techniques. So now for about a thousand bucks, you can go out and you can buy this little electrical resistance meter, and you can put it on a piece of aluminum, and it'll tell you what the heat treatment of the aluminum is, okay? And that basically was developed because they had to go out there and inspect the wings and figure out if they had problems. It turns out there weren't really big problems. But, you know, they get into modeling, you know, one nozzle, how much cooling did you get from the two adjacent nozzles and everything else. But it was a big concern uh, when things go wrong. Uh, just the wrong thing that goes wrong, which would be a big problem. Um, it turns out that, uh, let me just kind of comment about this, because I brought it for a week now and haven't talked about it. Um, to roll things thinner and thinner, you can have great big rolls. But to make things very thin, you have to have small rolls. There's a rule of thumb that the rolls can't be bigger than 500 times the, diet, the thickness of what you're rolling. So if I want to roll something that's, and you can roll foil. And foil is, uh, let's say the foil is 2,007 inch thick. That means that my roll can't be bigger than one inch in diameter, 500 times 2,000, right? And it turns out the reason for that is I got big forces on this, and the roll actually is gonna deform. And if you actually put the sheet through there, and the rolls are too big, then all the roll does is elastically deform and lets the sheet through without deforming, without uh, essentially causing it to, to distort. Or, or, uh, so it turns out, if I wanna make foil material, foil material, there's something called a Zenzimer uh, mill, which is a whole series of rolls and Zenzimer is S-Z-E-N-D-M-I-R, I think. Um, anyway, there's actually, I'm just using bigger roll out here. They have like four layers of rolls, and then you have the same thing down here. So you go one, two, three, and then, so there's an arc of two, and finally an arc of four. A Z-mill, it's called Z, it is S-E-N-D-Z-I-M-I-R, -E okay. Uh, they call it a Z-mill. If you go over here to Newton where they make the cattle sheep and stuff, they have a little Z-mill. costs five million bucks. If you're a stainless steel company, Allegheny, Dalgon, just put one in for $25 million for a little Z-mill, which you can fit in this room. You go down here to the gold companies down in Attleboro, they have a little Z-mill that costs five million bucks. If you want to roll thin material, you have to have small rolls, and if you're going to have small, long, wide rolls, you got to have something to back up this thing because it's too flexible. You get to great big rolls, bigger rolling mills, and they just have what they call four high mills. And a four high mill is you have a roll here, which might be two or three feet in diameter, and you have a roll up here, it can be even bigger, 
and all it's doing is providing the stiffness, the backing stiffness, to keep this guy from, from bending, so that you get a flat plate or a flat sheet as opposed to a, a bow plate. This happens to be some material I'll pass around on Monday, but this is uh, material that was it Nippon Steel gave me. I don't know, who can read that? It's on Japanese. Uh, uh, but in any case, I can read it later. Yeah, it says Shin. It says Shin Nipetsu right there, Nippon Steel. Um, anyway, this has got plastic on the inside and two layers of metal. So it's thin sheet metal with plastic on the inside and if they want to use it for uh, oil pans and cars so that you don't hear the noise. I mean, this is sound absorbing. It doesn't sound tinny, right? Well, the thing is, this has got to be expensive. This is not your $2 a pound type of stuff because you got to adhesively bond the, the plastic in between. You got to have two layers of very thin material in very expensive mills to get down that thin. So, and on Monday we'll talk about what we were supposed to talk about the last two days here is rolling of steel and how you get high strength steel and what is HSLA steel for those of you that are interested in building chips out of HSLA steels. Okay? There are some warrants to be Let's, uh, Last time I talked about Zenzimer mills and rolling. Um, the Z mill, uh, because your actual work rolls can't be more than 500 times, their diameter can't be more than 500 times the thickness of what you want to roll. If you want to roll thin sheet by less than 10 thousandths, you have to go to a Zenzimer mill. And so these things can have little work rolls that are one inch in diameter and three or four feet long. But if it's three or four feet long, obviously something that's more slender than the pencil, uh, it's got to have some backup. So it has extra rolls. You have two rolls behind this one, you have three rolls behind those two, and you have four rolls behind those uh, because you have to have two rolls around each roll to back it up. But that's the way you get the stiffness and the small diameter that you need for rolling. Uh, the world's largest rolling mill, which is at Alcoa in Davenport, Iowa, which is rolling a big heavy plate for, uh, uh, for lots of applications, but that's where most of the aircraft wing uh, plate comes from. Uh, if I remember, those are about six foot diameter rolls. Uh, so they're pretty good size rolls. And they, of course, they have pretty good width too. Typically, in uh, such mills, they have what's called a four high roll, and you just have a big backing roll and a work roll, which is usually smaller, the backing roll is just giving stiffness to the work rolls, and that's a four high mill, and there's all kinds of different sizes of four high mills. There's also just a simple two high mill, but two high mills can't have a very great width. And you're limited in roll product to the, uh, by the width of the uh, product that you want to make. Uh, the length is not so much of a problem, uh, particularly with continuous casting nowadays. You can end up with big long slabs coming in. Uh, but you you can't get put so much width because of the cost of the rolling mill. Uh, typically, on a steel plate, you can probably get something above eight feet, 96 inches. But I doubt you can get anything above 10 10 foot uh, width in terms of steel plate. Now, one of the things you'd like to do on thicker on plate and things, is you'd like to be able to cross roll, and, and they actually start. Let's say you got a 10 foot wide mill. You might start out rolling in one, well actually you wouldn't start out rolling that direction, you would start out with a plate um, and you would roll in one direction and then you turn it 90 degrees and roll the other way and that gets rid of some of this woody texture and you'll get more uniform properties if you can do some cross rolling, but you're limited in cross rolling by the width of the mill too. So there's only so much cross rolling that you're able to do. Yep. How do you cut the plate? Depends on the type of plate. I'm talking carbon steel plate, you basically just use a hot, uh, an oxyacetylene torch. And those torches will actually move down the line with the plate. So they're on a little gantry. And so you cut across that way. Uh, thinner plate, we actually use plasma cutting now. And we'll talk about oxyacetylene and plasma. Um, things like uh, aluminum in thinner section, you just shear it. Um, they have big shears. Really big shears. Just like metal shop, except now you can be shearing something four inches thick. Okay. Uh, no, 
know it's hot in many cases, and so it's it's a hot shear, but uh, it's, uh, it's it can be pretty impressive to see some of these shears just kind of come down and slice this stuff up. I'm going to talk about the heat treat in just a second, okay? Um, because there's the answer is yes to both of those questions. Um, in fact, basically in rolling, if I go back to the the old days, the old days being pre-1960 or pre-1970, when I rolled steel, because of the limitations on the rolling mills, and just to give you an idea, a plate mill today or a sheet metal mill, uh, and they're two different mills because they have different size rollers and everything, and different numbers of rollers. A sheet metal mill may have six, a gang of six of these four high mills right next to each other with only like four or five feet in between. Um, so that you can do continuous rolling and you're taking big bites. You put in something as a cold mill might be uh, 150,000 stick and it comes out at 20,000 stick. But it's been rolled six times in one pass, if you will, because there's six mills in the series. Yeah? Yeah, a uh, typical reduction per pass is something on the order of 20 to 30 percent. Okay, now sometimes it's only 10 percent, but You'd like, it depends on how, if it's hot rolling and the stuff is soft, you know, just like the blacksmith heats it up to soften it, then you can get, easily get uh, up to 30%. You can't do much more. And the limitation is the friction coming in. You know, if you try to take too big a bite, the rolls won't grab it and pull it through because it's, it's being pulled through by friction. And if you don't have enough friction on your rolls, and these are highly polished rolls, which is exactly the opposite of what you want for friction, right? And they're also lubricated to give a good surface finish. So your friction coefficient is low, but if you go back and study rolling technology, the whole idea of controlling friction is key to getting good quality product. Surface finish, uh, reduction, and all these other things. Okay, now if things, things are hot, there's not any lubrication on them, uh, uh, particularly except for the metal oxide that's on the surface. But for things cold rolling, lubrication is everything, because that gives you sur surface finish and stuff. So. But friction is key to the whole thing, and it does control the amount of reduction. The capital cost of a sheet metal mill or a plate mill right now is somewhere between half a billion and a billion dollars for the mill. So we don't go throwing around building new ones all the time. Uh, and the problem back before the 1970s was we just didn't have the horsepower and the size of the mills to do anything other than roll up here in the gamma region. This is the iron carbon phase diagram. This is basically a fundamental phase diagram for steel. Melting is up at 1600 C. This is 910 for almost no carbon in steel. This is what's called the eutectoid temperature where you go from face center cubic iron crystal structure to body center cubic. Most of the iron that you know of at room temperature, except for some of the stainless steels, is body center cubic down here at room temperature. And it's got some iron carbide, which is the other phase over there. So this is 100% iron here. And over there you have iron carbide. Actually, if you keep on going, beyond about 2% here, you get into the cast irons. But the low carbon steels are over here, the medium carbon steels are here, the high carbon steels are here. We really don't make much of anything, maybe some, except maybe some tool steels between 1% and 2% carbon. From 2 to 4% carbon, or 2 to 6% carbon in some cases, you have the cast irons. So a large, this is a very important phase diagram industrially. And if you go to the literature uh, and see whose name is on the phase diagram, it's John Chipman. Uh, John Chipman came here in 1946 to MIT. Uh, from Georgia Tech as a physical chemist, and he came to the materials department. Actually, he came earlier in 46. He came, became department head about 46 or something. Uh, anyway, he came in like 38. And I knew John Chipman in his retirement. Um, but it turns out the iron carbon phase diagram that the rest of the world uses right now, John Chipman did when he was uh, in his mid-70s, right around the corner here. It's like 1973 edition. Uh, of the iron carbon phase diagram, but he, the, the materials department conference room is the John Chipman room. Uh, John Chipman is kind of revered in the rest of the world because he basically took the principles of physical chemistry and applied them to high, melt, high temperature melts. And all of his students afterwards basically have revolutionized 
the ability to control the composition of steel in the world. But in any case, so a little MIT history. Um, the, uh, in the old days, they just didn't have the power, and so they had to get things hot and soft in order to roll them. And because of that, at high temperatures, the steel recrystallizes and the grains grow and you get large grains. And you're limited in the strength of the, of the steel that you can roll when you do that. So this is basically hot rolling up here. That you're doing. <laughs> what happened in the 1960s and the 70s, actually in the 60s, people started studying what happens when you roll in this two-phase region where you have some, both some FCC iron and some BCC iron. And you also have, a, it's two phases, so I have a high carbon version and a low carbon version. It gets to be fairly complex. And when you do this, between roll passes, you will cold work the material, you'll get new grains to recrystallize, but then you will actually deform them again while they're in the process of growing these new soft grains. And you can start redistributing the carbon in all kinds of different ways, and you get what are called control roll steels. And sometimes they use CR as the abbreviation for controlled rolled steel. Um, that's dynam dynamic recrystallization. It was big in the 1970s. It was big in the 19. It's big in the 1980s. It's still used. And you get kind of pancake-shaped grains. Up here, the grains become more equiaxed and fairly large size. Down here, you can get smaller grains, pancake-shaped, and you can double and triple the strength of the steel if you have a big, powerful mill and you're willing to roll down at these lower temperatures where it takes more energy. But you can double the strength of the steel for the same carbon composition. And you start adding other special elements we call microalloying elements, things like niobium and vanadium and titanium at like 200 parts per million or 400 parts per million do a lot to form niobium carbides or vanadium carbides or nitrides or titanium carbides and nitrides or carbonitrides. A lot of metallurgy that goes in here. Billions of dollars have been spent studying controlled rolled steels. Most of the line pipe in the world, um, certainly in the 70s and 80s, and line pipe is, you know, gas transmission pipe or the oil transmission pipe, the Alaskan pipeline is controlled rolled steel. Made mostly by the Japanese because the United States didn't have the mills in the 1970s to produce the steel. The Japanese had more modern mills. And so they actually produced the steel for the, most of the steel for the Alaskan uh, pipeline. U.S. mills can, can do controlled rolling now, um, but that's controlled rolling. The problem with this is the pancake grains tend to give a very woody structure. And so the properties are not very uniform in all three dimensions. So it turns out in the 1980s, the Japanese said, oh, well, if I could cool the steel down faster from some of these temperatures, I could get dynamic recrystallization even while it's being deformed and as it's cooling, I can recrystallize, I can get these small grains, and I can cool it down before those small grains turn into big grains. So up here in the hot rolling region, the grains grow so fast, you always end up with large grain steel. Here you end up with controlled rolling, pancake grains, but if I do accelerated cooling, I can get very small equiax grains. Why do I want small grain crystals in my steel? Because grain size is the only thing that increases both toughness and strength. Anything else you do to steel, it's a trade-off between strength and toughness. Small grain size will give you both, and it's the only thing that will give you both. So the reason I can double the strength of controlled roll steels compared to hot rolled is because these pancake grains are smaller and they have more mechanical work in them, if you will, rather than being completely annealed at the high temperatures. Basically, what the Japanese started doing, and actually other people have done the research on this here in the United States in the 60s, but the Japanese actually put it into application in the 80s. They built whole plants with accelerated cooled steels. And um, now you can get grain sizes that are a factor of 20 or 30 smaller than the hot rolled steels. You make a hot rolled iron carbon alloy, and it's going to have a strength, a yield strength of 40 KSI. 
In fact, the garden variety structural steel uh, in the United States is A36, ASTM A36 spec, just so how it used to be A7. But A36 has a minimum specified yield strength of 36,000 pounds per square inch. I don't know if they gave it the A36 number. I mean, they don't, they don't give numbers based on the strength of the material, but A36 steel has 36 KSI. I don't know if they uh, kind of use that number for that reason. But uh, um, However, 36,000 pounds per square inch, is, that's not much stronger than some decent aluminum alloys. And steel has the potential to be much stronger than that. Very few people today are building buildings out of 36 KSI steel. If you just order some random steel plate from a, uh, a mill, they'll sell you A36. Uh, it's still used quite extensively, but most designers for buildings and beams and stuff are going to use 50 KSI steel. And in the last five or 10 years, they're starting to offer 70 KSI steel, uh, yield steel. And obviously, you can use a lot less steel if it's stronger. The Japanese started going to accelerated cooling, and what they did was not try to increase the strength so much because you could already get 50 and 70 KSI for line pipes, uh, and that's what people really wanted. Or sh 50 KSI for shipbuilding and commercial ships is all you really want. I mean, you get to the point where your corrosion allowances get to be greater than uh, the, 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 the allowance you put in for thickness of corrosion gets to be more significant than getting strength up. Okay, you have to make it thick because it's going to corrode. Uh, and it'll be too thin if you if you go to too high strength steel. So they were happy with the strength, but what they wanted to do is move this way down to lower carbon content to improve the weldability. And so they went to accelerated cooling. Uh, accelerated cooling is nothing more than you you put a very special shower on the plate as you finally finish it. You send it on its last pass through this tunnel on the end of the steel mill, which squirts water on it from all sides, bottom, top. And it has to be very, very uniform. Because if you squirt water the wrong side, you know, it's not, not uniform. And of course, if the water starts to condense on the surface and roll off the edge, you get complex heat transfer, difference from the center to the edge and everything else. You had to work out all that stuff. Uh, otherwise, you end up with a pretzel. And the, the first few plates that came off looked like pretzels. I mean, they, you know, it, it, they looked like potato chips coming off the mill, literally. And they had as much curvature as potato chips. And that's a lot of garbage. But they persisted for several years of making potato chips and, uh, and remelting the potato chips and finally got to the point where they could make flat plate. Then they sent it to, sh to the steel mill. Uh, not steel mill, but the shipyards in, in Japan in the uh, mid-'80s. And they were shipbuilding in Japan was great, going great guns in the 70s and 80s before the Koreans and the Taiwanese and the Romanians and others took over, and now the Chinese. Um, and the problem then became one of you still had locked in residual stresses. This could be a half inch thick steel plate, but I accelerated cooled, which meant that the top surface was cooling at a different rate than the center, just because of heat transfer through the solid. And it might have been a flat plate that came from the mill, but as soon as I flame cut it, it turned into a, not a, not a, uh, a pretzel or a potato chip, but it, it curled. And now I had all kinds of fairing problems in the shipyard of putting these things together. Um, they started, when I went through, the, I spent a year in Japan with the Office of Naval Research, and when I would go through the shipyards in 84 and 85, I would see them doing strange things with the flame cutters. I mean, they would have one torch coming along and cutting the thing, and then six inches behind it or a foot behind it, they'd have another torch coming by and cutting a half inch off that. And I'd say, well, why are you doing that? Does that improve the quality? Oh, yeah, it improves the quality. What it was is they were controlling the residual, residual stresses and distortion, I realized later, after I went to Korea. And the Koreans told me that they were able to buy accelerated cool plate from Japan, but the Japanese wouldn't tell them how to cut it without distortion because they wanted the steel companies were in bed with the Japanese shipyards and didn't want to give the Koreans the competitive advantage of how, knowing how to, to uh, cut it easily. Um, so they were doing all kinds of things. And they now can produce accelerated cool plates without cutting problems, but you have to know there's technology to doing the cutting, and it changes with thickness and with mill. So basically, the steel companies almost have to tell you, this is how to cut our plate. So it's, it gets to be a little bit more specialized. Finally, if we go back 
um, uh, to the 1950s, uh, or actually in the 1940s it started, they used to just use the hot rolled steel to make submarines and stuff. But in the 40s, there had been some research done that if you quenched in tempered plates, and so you heat it up here, you quench it in water, you heat it back up to an intermediate temperature, maybe 600 degrees Fahrenheit, 500 degrees Fahrenheit, or actually for HY80, you heat it up to about 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit to temper it. 1,000 Fahrenheit's down here somewhere. You can get very high strength. And in fact, they had constructional steels in the 1960s, T1 steels, uh, what U.S. Steel called them, 100 KSI strength. And they build bridges out of them and things and have nice thin webs with 100 KSI strength. Lots of um, preheat needed for these things because they were fairly heavily alloyed and therefore they had a high carbon equivalent. We'll get to weldability and stuff. But they had problems with weldability, but they had tremendous toughness because they have very fine microstructure from this quenching and tempering operation. Why am I telling you about all of this? Well, if you look at the spec, the new spec for HSLA 65, or if you were to look at HSLA 80 or HSLA 100, which are naval constructional seals, 65 is hopefully going to be approved in the next six months or year for uh, um, uh, use in surface ship hulls, and they need it for the next class of aircraft carrier. But, but the HSLA steels at 180 and 100 KSI are already used in some other applications in uh, surface ships. And the, and the HY steels are, are back from the 1960s. They were developed in the 1960s, HY80, HY100. HY130 was developed back then. It's garbage. Don't ever use it. Okay, you spent $50 million developing it, but it can't be welded under practical conditions, only in laboratory conditions. But the Navy now has a spec that essentially includes all three, control rolled, accelerated cooled, which is usually called AC, and quench and tempered is called QT. So there's a single spec that says, for HSLA 65, says give me 65 KSI yield, and I can't remember what the tensile is, but it can be control rolled, accelerated cooled, or quench and tempered for different thicknesses up to about an inch and a half, inch and a quarter, inch and a half. If you're interested, I can get you the spec. Um, it, it is an ASCM spec. So they're trying to make it commercial um, and easily used interchangeably with commercial steels. Um, and these commercial steels have been around for 15 or 20 years or 30 years. So it's not as if there's great new technology here. What they're doing is they're using existing commercial technology and they're trying to make it meet the Navy specs, which include things like explosion bulge. You don't usually have to do explosion bulge on bridges, okay? Till now, till recently, more recently. Uh, but even so, um, the problem is you can get fantastic properties here. You're talking four or five bucks a pound because of the quenching and tempering operation. Very inexpensive, low preheat, um, tremendously easy to weld, but can have some distortion problems in, in because of the locked-in residual stresses. This can have variable properties in different directions. But all of these things are giving me much finer grain size and improving both my strength and my toughness. Um, the Navy's requirements for strength and toughness combination exceed those of bridges and buildings. Although bridges and buildings are coming up in the world in that uh, things like the Northridge earthquake in uh, California in the early 90s basically taught people you really do need toughness in uh, seismic uh, loaded structures. Now, why the civil engineers couldn't figure that out before the earthquake, okay, that you actually could, but they didn't. So, now, um, the last thing I will show you is an overhead of net shape casting. This is continuous casting done at Chaparral Steel, which is down in Midlothian, Texas, out of Dallas, outside of Dallas. And this is the cast shape. It's basically cast like an I-beam. So they're casting the steel not as a rectangular solid, but as an I-beam shape. It turns out by doing this, you can see they get cooler. I mean, here, you ask how they cut back here? On a hot piece of steel like this, you just blow oxygen on it. You don't even need to heat it up with a flame. It's already hot enough. You just blow oxygen, and the oxygen cuts right through the steel. And it's on a little gantry. And so they're cutting the continuous cast strand 
into billets that they can subsequently roll. It turns out that by going to net shape casting, which took them a little while to figure out, it's not a, exactly a simple thing to uh, take care of all the stresses as this thing solidifies. Um, oops, I thought I had on here. Um, the number of passes. Um, but in any case, it must be on another overhead I didn't bring. But the uh, they went from something like 28 passes. If you start out with a rectangular slab and want to make an I-beam, they used to do something like 28 passes, and now they're down to like 11 passes to finish off the I-beam from this. They get finer grain size because they started out with a finer grain size. It turns out finer grain size means greater strength. At Chaparral, if you buy A36 steel or grade 50 steel, they ship you the same thing. They only inventory one one material. If you order an A36, they'll ship you and they'll call it A36. It'll actually have 50 KSI yield instead of 36. It'll be just as weldable as A36, but you get the extra strength because they've got the better cooling in the net shape. Uh, it turns out they've also been able to make smaller I-beams than anyone could make before because there's less rolling and they, it keeps its heat longer. So now they actually can do it. They're making mobile homes and shipping them overseas made out of very thin I-beams. So you've got smaller sections than anyone could ever roll before. So they've actually created a new market. It turns out the American steel industry um, has, in 1980, they were losing their shirts. And about everyone said they were going to go under. It turns out the productivity of the American steel industry doubled in the 1980s because necessity is the mother of invention. You know, extinction is a something that helps the possibility of extinction helps clarify the mind, and people are, are willing to take risk. Um, and so it turns out today, the most e efficient steel mills in the world are located in the United States. And that's because if they weren't, they wouldn't be located in the United States. There wouldn't be any steel mill if they weren't more e efficient than their competition. Um, to finish up on material selection, uh, Rudyard Kipling said, gold is for the mistress, silver is for the maid, copper for the craftsman, cutting at his trade, good said the baron, sitting in its hall, but iron, cold iron, is master of them all. Um, people are still going to be using 90% iron. Maybe we're, maybe not 95% iron, but in your lifetime, we will still be using 90% iron for all the metal in the world. Today we're using 95%. I'm not saying some other metals aren't going to take, make some inroads, but... Don't think that iron is out. It may not be profitable, and you may not want to invest in the steel industry, but it's going to be there. 